Welcome to The Fairer Sense. With me, Tanya. And me, Kara. Women, money, and the fight to break even. Because we give a shit. And you should too. Today's episode, Evolving Careers Part 1, When There Is No Roadmap. Hey, Kara. Hey, Tanya. Ooh, I always feel like I want to say welcome back. <laughs> I always want to be like, welcome back to another episode of our podcast. Welcome to your own home. I know. <laughs> this is, I think, a really interesting topic, one about women in what we might call non-traditional career paths, which I think is something that you can relate to a whole lot more than I can. Oh, yes. I feel like <laughs> I don't even know that I've had a career path. I often think about this. I just I just sit down and examine my own life and I just think, how? How did I get here? <laughs> but I think more and more people are kind of maybe not having the how question. You know, more and more people are seeing that they don't have to have traditional career paths, that more things are open to them and that in some ways it's easier than literally ever before to make pivots and to kind of do your own thing or pursue a path that maybe you thought you couldn't pursue. And so I'm excited to get into that. Yeah, it's funny because when we started talking about this episode and the idea of a career that you figure out without having a clear roadmap for it, I thought, wow, yeah, I can't relate to that at all. I was with the same employer for 16 years. And in a way, though, like I did the traditional career path option, but that's almost becoming the non-traditional thing because most people, if they do have a W-2 type job, switch jobs every few years and more and more people are working on their own and are at least freelancing on the side in some way. Like I did teach fitness classes in addition to doing my day job, but it's something where what a career is, is kind of changing a lot. The spectrum of things that can be a career now is so much broader than it used to be. It's not just like, do you work full-time or part-time. It's, do you work full-time? Do you work full-time and have a side hustle? Do you do that side hustle for someone else or for yourself? Is your side hustle your full-time thing? Is that for someone else, for a bunch of clients? There's so many different shapes that a career can take now that even when I came out of college, like 20, oh God, it's been almost 20 years. <laughs> old. Even then, like that just, the range of options was much smaller. And so we tend to talk about having to be freelance or gig economy stuff as like a negative, but in a way, it's a good thing to have more choices, right? I mean, I think there's always a dark side that we could pull out. But for me, something that I find really interesting and highly suspect is how the internet has created kind of like internet gurus and people who are like, well, I did this thing. So now you should buy from me or follow me or whatever, whatever. And they don't really offer any tangible proof. They're just like, yeah, believe me, I had a million dollar launch. Believe me. <laughs> it's like, well... Can I see some facts? Can I see your profit and loss sheet? What do you, what, are, how much did you spend on marketing? How much of that was actually profit? Things like that. Like it's, how everyone is a social media marketing expert. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I say that as someone who is kind of in this world. So I'm well aware of the, the irony here, but I do think we're tearing down these kind of ivory towers and we're saying that, you know, you just don't necessarily need these traditional credentials to be incredibly impactful. On the other side of things, I always tell people, do your homework, make sure you understand understand who you're listening to and have a critical lens, especially have a critical lens if you're opening your wallet for these people. It's definitely clear that the nature of work is changing. As with the last episode, today we're talking to two people who make a good part of their living writing online. But I think that doesn't mean that's all we're talking about. I think it's a broader question of not just like who are the people doing this well, but like thinking about what is even a career, if that makes sense. Like what does that look like if we're doing a bunch of different things that may or may not all tie together? And do we even need it to be a cohesive arc? Yeah, I think I'm also interested. One of our guests is definitely in a traditional career, but got there from sort of outside the upper echelon. And that's something, too, that I'm really excited about that's happening today is that there have always been these kind of hierarchies, right, of like, well, New York media is hard to break into or traditional publishing is looking for a specific voice and we are not looking for other voices. And so it's always been harder for certain communities to get into certain types of work. And I do think that if you want to be a traditional, yeah, I'm working here for 30 years, or this is the field I know I want to be in, but you don't know anyone who's in that field, or you're not sure like 
where to go to do your internship or to do your first job. There are more and more resources around that and more and more people kind of breaking through that glass ceiling. And that's something that gets me so excited. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, should we just get to it? Let's just get to it. Let's get to it. I spoke with Jada Gomez, who is formerly the executive editor at Bustle and currently the senior platform editor at Medium. She has worked in media for years, and we started our conversation with me asking how she got into this field without any connections. Growing up, I did not know anyone who worked in the industry, but my uncle went to NYU Dental, and so I just knew that I was going to become a doctor and from NYU and follow his path. I was a double major focusing on pre-med and broadcast journalism. And I just kind of noticed by my junior year that with my sciences, I was just kind of like going through the motions but I was super passionate about all of my journalism courses, all of my cultural criticism courses. I finished all of my pre-med requirements, so my dad didn't have a heart attack. I was like, you know what? I'm going to try this journalism thing. If I'm super poor, I will just take the MCAT and I'll get back on that track. And so, yeah, from there, I spent, this is now my 14th year, which is insane um, in the industry. But as soon as I graduated, I became an assistant at Time Inc., had very much the devil was Prada kind of experience, but my Miranda was a man. And that led me to my first job at Time Magazine, since he happened to be the Washington bureau chief before working at Fortune. So because I put in like a really hard year with him and worked as worked my butt off, I proved myself and I was able to move on to that role. And then from there, year was I was 23, one of the youngest editors at Time, never ever could imagine leaving Time, like how would you? But I started in the age of layoffs in media. So from there, it was definitely knocked around a bit. I was at Time for a few years, then I moved on to People. I was on the sales side at People, which was also very interesting because of the layoffs. That was where I could get placed. So I learned a lot about like online digital sales, but again, it was not what I really wanted to do. I feel like that part of my career, when I was going through it, I would just get so upset and talk to my mom. I'm like, this is not what I want to do. But I was also able to do a lot of red carpet work for them. So I learned about both sides of the business, which is just super valuable now. And then after that, I had a few digital jobs. I worked at Hip Hop DX. Um, so I did that for a bit. And then I became the site director at Latina, which was really awesome. And I got to diversify some of the ways people see Latinas, introducing Afro Latinas to their covers. And then from there, I landed at Bustle. What do you think has been a consistent habit or tool that you've used throughout your career thus far that has propelled you up? My answer might seem a little simple, but I think it really is about doing your best work and really being solid and kind to people. I always use the example of my Miranda Priestley boss, who we're really close. We're great. So he doesn't mind me saying that. But I could have, you know, gone in every day and be like, oh, my gosh, I hate being an assistant. You know, I graduated from one of the best schools in the country. Like, this is stupid. This is beneath me. But every day I came in and if I was ordering lunch for like a staff meeting or, or, you know, getting to write captions or pitching stories, whatever it was, I went in with my same amount of energy and tried to bring my best to it. And I think that starting out, that is something that I've kind of kept with me and it's always kept me humble. So I think just making sure that if something passes by my desk, that it's really solid and that I've given it my best and then people will get to know you for having a great attitude and a great reputation. And I do think that that is one of the main things that has really helped me. You'll hear that same kind of thread about, you know, just making sure that you're good to your peers. A lot of people love to make sure that they're like impressing their bosses, but when it comes to their peers, they might, you know, try to step over them for opportunities. But 
your peers matter too. And so at this point in my career, a lot of opportunities at other magazines, at other sites, a lot of these sites are being run by people that I kind of came up with as a puppy. And if I didn't treat them right, there's no way that they would recommend me or want to have me come onto panel. Um, So I think that just having a really good, solid reputation with your work and a good aura, I think really, really matters. And then I also love to, like, if people are starting out new, I always try to pair them with good people who are within the industry, whether, especially with hip hop, like there's a lot of young female writers in particularly that always want to dip their toe into that world. And it can be really rough if you're a woman. So I always try to kind of align them with the people in that part of the business that I know are like really solid, really great editors and people that they'll learn from. This is a perfect segue because something that we hear a lot is that women need to advocate for themselves. And I think more and more there are groups and organizations of women who are trying to funnel more women to the top and help them. But ultimately there are nuances to advocating for yourself because, you know, I'm white passing and you're a woman of color. We have different privileges and we have different struggles, right? So it's not just like we can read from the same script and get the same result. I guess I'm curious about your experience. Have you ever walked into a room and been the only woman or the only person of color and felt isolated, essentially? And even if that hasn't happened, what would you like to see happen to get more people like yourself into the room with you? Oh, yes. I feel like I've definitely walked into rooms where I've been the only person of color and also like a decade ago, the youngest person. So it's like being 22 and also a woman of color in a room full of people who don't look like you and don't have your experiences and may have the experiences that you did in in their youth, but they're completely past that and can't really see that anymore. And I think that it is intimidating. For me, whenever I walk into a room and I'm the only person of color, I'm the only woman, for me, I'm always kind of like, okay, so I see I see what it is. And I see what needs to change. And I try to bring value to that room. If I'm the only woman of color in a room, I always try to think of the people that I know who may not have the education that I have. I always use the the example of a Cardi B and the respectability politics. I try to bring their issues to that table because I know that I'm speaking to people who may have no idea that the issues that they have exist. So I always do try to kind of like go wide lens. I'm also mixed race, so it's like I try to remember the things that my mom goes through as a black woman, a dark-skinned black woman, and then my dad as like a white passing Latino trying to like make sure that I'm pulling apart those two identities and really reflecting them. But then at the same time, I try not to become the teacher (laughs) because I think that what happens, which is really unfortunate with a lot of people of color, is that we then become like the poster child of Black experiences or Asian experiences. And I'm very quick to say we had a really great package by one of our editors on Black women and 4C hair. And people would ask me about that and particularly like just people outside of the company who would want me to come and speak about it. And I'm like, well, I don't have 4C hair and that's not my experience and I can't speak to that. So you're going to have to find someone from the stories. So just really making sure that I'm not becoming this poster child that people see in a room and then also not explaining things. I think that we have Google. (laughs) We have a lot of ways where you can learn about different cultures. I'm really big on like diversifying your Twitter network diversifying your friend group. I mean, that was never an issue for me in New York. I'm around so many different experiences and I can empathize in so many ways. But I think that if you are a person in a room and there's one person of color to make sure that they don't become the encyclopedia or the kind of like poster child for that experience, like to make sure that we're all doing our research and that that doesn't become an extra burden on them. I'm curious, as someone who has an amount of power in your role and gets to make editorial decisions and give pieces to writers and really expand who gets to be featured on the site, how do you think companies can retain people of color and women and do more than just like, this job is open for diverse candidates, but actually create a welcoming and safe atmosphere for people so that they can continue, so that they can keep going? 
So I went to an all girls school. I went to an all girls high school. And I just remember, oh, people have a lot of thoughts about all girls schools, but I was definitely someone who just loved coming into school and just seeing, you know, a whole bunch of women who look different. You have people who are like super, super into sports. Like you had the jocks. Like I was part of like the AP nerd crew, but we all were able to have that four years where we weren't told or discouraged to do something because we weren't boys, we weren't men, um, we were able to do whatever we wanted to do. We had a robotics team, we had all of these things. So there was just no limit for what women could do, which was just a really great training ground for me. When I first started, I kept bringing up that same example because I just felt really empowered by being around all of these really smart women with one goal in mind to really inform millennial readers and people really had that spirit. And I think that if you're in a company where you don't feel nurtured or you don't feel valued, they say that people leave jobs because of bosses. And I think that's so, so true or leadership. And if you have really great leadership, you kind of like buy into that and you want you feel nurtured and you want to stay. So I think that that's really important. I think in terms of keeping and retaining people of color, it's just to make sure that they're really being heard and they're being valued, not because of their blackness or their Latinxness or their Asianness, but their opinions really matter. Like for example, for me, I was so excited that Punky Brewster is coming back because I grew up watching that show and loving that show. But that show has nothing to do about being black in America. It has nothing to do about being Latin in America. And my excitement for that show was definitely something that everyone kind of was like, oh my gosh, she is the expert in this. She has to help us lead this charge with Punky Brewster versus like me always having to lead the charges for things that have to do particularly with people of color. And I think a lot of times like our unconscious bias or our implicit bias or our well-meaningness to be as inclusive as possible can sometimes put people of color in an office in a very weird place. Big thanks to cloud accounting software FreshBooks for sponsoring season four of The Fairer Sense, the third season of the show they've sponsored in its entirety. We love FreshBooks, both because they've been such a big supporter of the Ferris Sense and because they provide the simplest, easiest to use cloud accounting software out there, which you can try by visiting freshbooks.com slash TFC. If you're a small business owner or freelancer, there are so many things you have to think about from actually making money to keeping track of it. FreshBooks takes the work out of getting paid, so you can focus on doing the work you need to do to keep your business running. With FreshBooks, you can create a customized invoice, track all your income, and link a business credit card to automatically track business spending. FreshBooks makes it super simple to do your accounting, and it makes accounting one less thing you need to worry about as a business owner, so you can focus instead on crushing the financial patriarchy. Head to freshbooks.com slash TFC to claim your 30-day free trial and enter the fairer sense in the how did you hear about us section. You get to try a great product while supporting us. That's freshbooks.com slash TFC. People we love living longer? Very cool. People we love running out of money later in life? Not cool. Age Up is a new product issued by Mass Mutual and sold by Haven Life that helps solve the problem of loved ones outliving their money. Age Up buffers families from the financial strain of supporting loved ones who live longer than their current financial reality allows. Here's how it works. Age Up helps adult children in their 30s and 40s who worry their parents won't have enough money to last into their 90s and beyond. You pay the monthly premiums for Age Up and then receive the monthly payouts once your parent reaches the trigger age. The purchase process is simple, straightforward, and 100% digital. There's no upfront contribution required and monthly premiums can start as low as $25. Women are paid less throughout their career and are more likely to be family caregivers. Age Up is a product that can help lessen financial burdens on women as their parents age. Head to age-up.com slash the fairer sense to get started and see how Age Up can help you provide for a loved one who lives past 90. That's age-up.com slash the fairer sense. I spoke to Paula Pant, who is a well-known fixture of the personal finance community. She writes the blog, 
Afford Anything and hosts the podcast Afford Anything. Originally, she thought that she was going to go to law school. And we talked about her transition out of that into thinking about being an academic and finally trying to pursue a career in journalism. So there I was, senior year, about to graduate with a sociology degree, realizing that this plan that I had had the entire time, which is go to grad school, get a PhD, become a professor, realizing that that was no longer my plan. I then faced the question of, all right, what do I want to do? At that time, I was obsessed with the news. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should go into journalism, but I didn't have a degree in it. So I spotted a flyer for a media mixer. You had to be a graduating senior from the J school in order to attend. But I figured if I just walked in with confidence, nobody would question me. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So I walk into this mixer and I walk straight up to the owner of one of the two local papers. And I introduce myself and say, hi, I'm about to graduate. I do not have a J school background. I would like to get my foot in the door. How do I start? And he basically told me to go away. So then I went to the managing editor of that same paper. I went one step down the chain and I said the same thing to him. And he said, all right, tell you what, I will give you three freelance articles. I'll pay you $75 per article. Let's see how you do on those. I wrote those three articles for him at 75 bucks a pop, submitted it. He loved it. And he offered me an unpaid internship upon graduation. That fall after graduation, he promoted me to a paid intern. And then by the end of the fall, he gave me a full time job as a newspaper reporter. And that was how I got my foot in the door as a newspaper reporter, despite having no journalism degree. I definitely came out of college thinking I was going to do journalism and could not get a job. So I'm jealous (laughs) that that worked. So you did that job for three years and you're not still a journalist. So what ultimately happened? What what told you that that was not going to be your full path? I had a starting salary of twenty one thousand dollars and I would still pay out of pocket to send myself to local conferences. And the primary thing I learned going to journalism conferences during that time period is that the future of journalism was clearly going to be freelance and online. Many newspapers around the country were shutting down. The Rocky Mountain News was shutting down. The Seattle Post-Intelligencer was closing. It was clear that this was a shrinking industry, but that the entrepreneurial opportunities for people who wanted to go solo were expanding quite rapidly. And so I decided that that was the direction I was going to take. While I was at the newspaper, I started gathering freelance assignments. My best paying freelance client at that time paid 50 cents a word. So here I was making a salary, a full-time salary of $21,000 a year, but I had this side gig, this freelance gig that I worked on in the evenings where I could write a 300-word article in two hours and make, on average, $150 an hour. So not only were there more opportunities in my field for freelancers and for people who wanted to break out on their own solo, but also, at least at an hourly basis, the pay was better. I recognized while I was at the paper that that was going to be my future. And in 2008, I voluntarily quit a newspaper job, which nobody does. Like in the shrinking industry like journalism, no one quits, especially at the beginning of the Great Recession. So everyone told me I was nuts. Everyone told me I was going to commit career suicide. They said I'd never get a job again. And in hindsight, they were right. I never did get a job again. I began working for myself from that point forward. The advice that's often given to freelancers is to start a blog. And so at the same time that I began freelancing, I also started AffordAnything.com. And eventually, over time, Afford Anything gained a large enough audience that I was able to give up freelancing so that I could focus full time on the blog and then later the podcast and all of the other brand extensions that come out of the Afford Anything umbrella. Making that leap, obviously, from a full time job in newspaper, which you already knew the industry was shrinking and that those jobs would be hard to come by, if not impossible in the future, you made that leap. Was there someone whose career you looked at and thought that would be interesting to follow? Or have you been kind of figuring it all out without having your own map? I would say that every stage has been an iteration of the previous stage. It didn't start with a grand plan. Like I didn't start with this idea that one day I would form a brand and that brand would have a podcast and a blog and we would do workshops where we go to Ecuador and talk about financial independence. Like it was impossible for me to imagine when this all began. 
being a full-time freelance journalist was an iteration of being a newspaper reporter. And then having a blog on the side was an iteration of being a freelance journalist. And then once I got into the world of blogging and I started reading about other people who were doing it full time, like Pat Flynn, it taught me that that was an option if I wanted to lean into it and if I wanted to iterate out of freelance writing and into full time blogging. So, yes, there were plenty of people who I followed, but they were different people at each step of the game. Now, given where you are, which is at a level of success that I'm sure a lot of people would love to emulate and a lot of people aspire to and admire, do you have a vision for where you want to be headed in the future? Or are you thinking about it more in terms of like, things are going great, I want to keep this going and then see what inspires me next? Afford Anything has one full-time employee other than myself. Her name's Erin. And she gave me really good advice at the end of last year as we were talking about what we wanted our plans to be. She said, pick one thing a year and have that be your big thing. Because there's so much work that's involved just in in maintaining what you're currently doing at work and in life that it can be easy to form grandiose five-year plans or to want to take on far too many new projects. Whatever that is, whether it's a new project or a refresh of something that you're already doing, that's the way that I like to think about it. One thing a year, that's going to be the thing. Everything else we maintain. Do you also then think about what those things might add up to over time or do you literally just take it one year at a time? I mean, I would say in the back of my mind, I do have my someday maybe list, but I also know that my perspective might change in a year or two and and I'm open to that. I have a loose idea, but it's not a plan or a goal. It's more of a daydream assuming that nothing changes. Whereas when I think about my plans for the next 365 days, I can plan that with much greater clarity. You obviously made the big leap of jumping from a full-time job to freelance. And for sure, I think the money was a compelling case there because you weren't earning very much. But it's still, to me, like you're my hero for doing that because I've always called early retirement entrepreneurship for wimps because (laughs) it's like you get to do what you want to do. But if you're someone like me who's very risk averse and has a, a really hard time giving up a paycheck and health insurance and that kind of stuff, the thought of taking that leap when you don't necessarily have a huge cushion built up, like anyone who does that is just automatically my hero. What was in your head when you were making that choice and what ultimately convinced you to to bet on yourself and, and make that leap? The fact that I freelanced while I was still at my day job, that had two benefits. One was that it allowed me to save more money than I otherwise could. But the other, and I think much bigger benefit, much more important benefit, is that it gave me confidence and it gave me proof of concept. I knew that I could pick up freelance assignments because I already had. I already was picking up freelance assignments. And I had several clients who were giving me regular recurring monthly assignments. So the fact that it was already going on part time gave me confidence to be able to make that leap to scale it to full time. The other part of it is, Tanya, exactly as you said, I think in many ways I was lucky. It was a blessing in disguise that I didn't make very much. At my peak, my full-time salary was $31,000. And walking away from a job that pays $31,000 is, I think, not as scary as walking away from a job that pays $150,000. I might not be able to get a job in journalism again, but there's a good chance that I'd be able to find another job that I didn't mind that paid me $31,000. If you were starting your career now, you know, this is even though we're only a little over a decade past when you jumped out of your full time journalism job, obviously a ton has changed since then. Mm -hmm. And now we're in a situation where a ton of people are freelance or work for themselves or are piecing together little bits of different jobs or gig economy things much more out of necessity. You know, we know Mm -hmm. that millennials in particular, and this will be true for Gen Z folks too, that there just are fewer full time salary jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of folks are doing what you did, but not by choice. For those folks who are staring at this uncertain future or who are thinking about how do I piece these things together in a way that's going to feel coherent or even just feel purposeful, but also pay the bills, what advice would you give to folks who maybe, you know, haven't made the choice in an affirmative way like you did? There's research that's shown that 
job satisfaction comes when you feel mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And so if you are doing some type of freelance or gig economy work, ask yourself what type of work within that realm you can do that would give you a sense of mastery, autonomy, and purpose. So for example, um, if you wanted to be a freelance writer, is can you niche that down into some specific topic or subtopic that you could master so that you could be one of the most well-known writers, freelance writers within that niche topic. If you design websites or you're a graphic designer, even if if you walk dogs and, and you're the, a pet sitter for a certain geographic area, like how can you become the best in this niche market? Shrinking your world down to a niche and then aiming for mastery within that niche will not only produce higher income over time, but also give you that sense of of mastery, autonomy, and purpose that can lead to job satisfaction. For those who struggle, because this is a question I get a lot, because I talk a ton about having purpose with how you're using your time, for example, in early retirement. But a lot of folks say, okay, well, how do I find my purpose? Like, that's not something I know, or I don't know what my values are. So how do I align my spending to that What do you think is the secret to figuring out what your purpose is, especially on a work level? Purpose and its close cousin, passion, I think are often the consequence rather than the precursor. Oftentimes, once you get into a line of work, assuming that you have like minimum sufficient interest to enter that line of work, it can't be a field that you were forced into, then once you get into a particular line of work, And you learn more about it and you become better at it and you not only develop skills, but you also develop enough competence to know what you don't know and to know how much more you could do and you could learn in that field. That's where passion derives from. And once you have that level of passion in your work, purpose emerges from that because then you'll be able to see the applications of your work in bettering humanity and the applications of your work in how it can create the type of world that you want to live in. I don't think that that's something that can be gamed out in advance. Wow, what really struck home for me was something Paula said of purpose and passion come as a result of working, not as a precursor, because I feel like I have this conversation with people all the time. They're really passionate about something and they want to turn that into their work, but they don't actually know the systems or the business of it, or they don't actually want to be making money off of their passion. They just want to do their passion more. I feel like Paula is out here being like, nah, do the work first, figure out the work side of it. And the passion kind of develops from that, which I just feel like is flipping this whole thing on its head. And it's something I've experienced, I think. And I just find that really exciting and a really good way to view it. Yeah, I really loved when she said that. It's interesting to me how often I get the question of, well, how do I know what my values are? How do I find my purpose? And I really love Paula's approach to answering that, that you don't have to go into this knowing what those are, that those will come as you do more of the work and you figure out, you know, what is it here that as I'm doing it, I want to learn more about or that really excites me or that feels like it's good for the world. I just think that that first takes a lot of the pressure off of figuring out what your purpose is or having to like know what it is right out of the gate. And it also, I think, gives you permission to find a work purpose that might be different than your non-work purpose. Because like for me, I've written before on my blog about how I don't monetize the blog because I want it to feel fun and like a hobby and not feel like work. But it doesn't mean I'm not passionate about it. It gives me a sense of purpose. And then in the work that I do now, that's all the by choice stuff, that feels like it has a different kind of purpose. But I actually think it's a healthy thing to have work and non-work purpose. And so if you want to kind of leave the non-work stuff untainted, you don't want to get that into the financial realm, you can still move purposefully through your career. Yeah. And I think Jada is actually a really good example of that too, where, you know, her plan was to become a doctor. (laughs) She took all the courses, but 
while she was in college, she was taking those journalism courses and realized, oh, this is something I actually do feel a passion for. I'm going to pursue that. And hey, if it doesn't work out, you know, the MCAT's always there. (laughs) Um, So yeah, I think just having a little bit of grace with yourself about whatever kind of professional path you want to pursue and how you want to pursue it. There's no one right answer, which we're seeing more and more in today's world. Something else that I think about a lot is that I work for and by myself. I'm a company of one, no coworkers up in here. And what Jada said about not just being a good employee, but being a good coworker and how that has both benefited her in terms of her career and people now think of her and reach out to her and it's helping further her career. It's also a great way just to like treat people. I feel like we live in this startup bro culture and it's like work 18 hour days, never see your kids. If you love anything more than this company, you're dead to me. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What if we treated our employees and our coworkers with respect and like they were human beings that have interests and passions outside of work and we actually encourage them to pursue that. I just found Jada's points like so wholesome and so smart. If you're good to work with and you do good work, you're going to go far. I totally agree with all of that. I also think it's something that is undervalued in a big way. That is the one thing that does make me a little bit sad about a lot of folks moving into non-traditional type career paths. And not to say that everybody's doing that by choice, but I do think sometimes that bit about being good to work with gets lost. And maybe it's not even about non-traditional. It's just about like hustle culture. Like when you're hustling around the clock or you're overworked to a point of misery or your health collapsing, it's going to be very hard for you to get back to that place of like, how do I be good to work with? How am I kind to others? How do I respond to an angry email with empathy and things like that, that I think are, it's not like learning that stuff is fun. I think those things are drilled into you in kind of awful ways, (laughs) but like having some of those edges polished off and, and thinking about people that you work with as people is easier when you see them every day. And when you're around them constantly, than if you're working remotely or if you're in a dispersed kind of team or you're working solo. And so I think it's important to think about that. So I was really glad that Jada brought that stuff up. Here's a question for you, Tanya. As someone who worked in a very professional situation, often with high pressure, how would you advise people to say no in a professional context? If someone asks you for something or to do something and you can't or don't want to, how would you say no when you were still working? Oh, it's such a good question. And I do think oftentimes it's hard to say no, prefacing all of this with that and and knowing that sometimes it's just not going to be possible. I think the way that I, I would usually try to do it or that I'd recommend others do it is to really think very specifically about the situation and to understand why it is that you want to say no. Saying no because you already have too much on your plate and you know that you're going to under deliver is a very reasonable thing. Saying like, I just don't have capacity for that right now and I don't want the quality on it to suffer is a great way to say no. Sometimes you might say no by saying a partial yes of I don't have capacity to take this on, but if we want to assign it to someone more junior as a way of helping to train them, you know, I'd be happy to meet with them to discuss it or to to review it when they're done or something like that so we can use it as a learning opportunity. That was my favorite way to say no because it also is providing an opportunity to somebody else. Occasionally, you might have to say no because something feels unethical or it feels like bad counsel. And that was always a bit trickier because then you're dealing with making someone feel called out and that's the hardest. So I'd usually try to think about like, what's the most diplomatic way I could possibly say this? Or is honestly, sometimes if it's like a client, you don't always want to be totally honest with them and you might find a false (laughs) but convincing reason uh, for why you might need to say no to something. Although I always leaned on the side of being honest if possible, you know, of just saying like, you know, frankly, this isn't something I recommend and here's why, but I would always then go into it with an alternative. I hate when people just say no and, and give no other option. So I would try to do the no to this, but how about yes to this instead? approach. And still to this day, I think that's my favorite way to say no if I can. Although to be honest, now in my post-work life, I just say straight up no to a lot of stuff. Like when people want sponsored posts on my blog or want to guest write for me or want to come on this podcast when they're like white men who have nothing to contribute to this conversation. (laughs) Like just saying, no, that's not the right fit. Have a nice day. I've become okay with that too. Yeah. It's something that I, I get asked a lot, especially by young women. You know, we feel like we can't say no, we feel like we have to take on that work because that will get us ahead or like the boss will notice and something like that. Or even just we are people pleasers and we don't want to say no because then we're being mean or we're hurting their feelings. And the flip side of that is, do they give a fuck if they're like piling onto you? You know, and I don't mean piling like insults. I mean, piling like giving you more work than you can literally handle. So I love all of your suggestions. And I would just say, yeah, my big go-to move recently has just been, I don't have capacity for that right now. Or 
as a freelancer, a lot of times people really lowball me. I recently got an unbelievably terrible offer to write a thousand to 1500 words for $100, which for all my what? freelance writers out there Come on. is trash. And they started it off be- being like, you're a big name in the personal finance space. It would be an honor for us. We would love to work with you. You know, like, you know, I'm worth more. What the hell? Yeah. But- <laughs> pay you fairly for that. (laughs) But I was just like, I can't afford to work at this rate. Like I can't pay my bills at this rate. So thank you so much for considering me. No, thank you. (laughs) And so I just want to say wherever you are in your career, I do feel like no is such a powerful career tool. And in any type of work, it's such a powerful career tool, but it's something that so many people have a hard time with. I think in that case of someone just really lowballing you, that's just rude. And how dare they? You are a goddess and they need to pay you accordingly. (laughs) But I think in other things, like if it had been a good offer, but it just wasn't the right fit for you, or if it was at a time when you just couldn't deliver on their timeline. One of the things that I really love doing now, now that I am, you know, it's weird to think of myself in the freelance space since I'm, I don't think of myself as fundamentally working, but it's true that I work for myself and occasionally I will do things for other people. I love having others ready to refer people to. And so some of the time for me, that's like in a media story. If someone says like, oh, hey, can you speak to holding on to your mortgage for 30 years? I'm like, no, we paid off our house. But like, hey, let me send you to this person who can speak to that. And preferably also is like not a white dude trying to boost the diversity of it. But like, I love that for assignments too, of I can't do this right now, but here's someone who I think would be great. And then you can help friends out. Like, that's great. That pays it forward. You're spreading some of the love around in your community. And that I think is something where like not everyone is going to see themselves and their work in the types of things, for example, that we do of speaking and writing on the internet. But I do think in this day and age, having an online community in whatever your field is, is only good. And being able to refer others to them, they refer folks to you. That's all good. That's just helping us all grow together. Yeah, it's the power of a network, right? It's good for you. It's good for them. And again, to Jada's point where when she is the only woman in a room or the only person of color in a room, she'll think, who would be good in this room? Like, who do I know that I can pull up here with me? And this is something that I've put on my Instagram before on the Bravely Instagram, which is We Bravely Go, if you want to go check that out. It's I don't want to get to the top of the mountain alone. I want to turn around and say, hey, do you need a hand? Because I think that's something that people in positions of power have always done. And we see that with like family businesses. The son of the CEO becomes the next CEO. And it's like, oh, no, we're not going to interview anyone else for that job. Mm, Okay, that's fine. Um, But it's not just nepotism, but it is this, oh, actually, I know someone who's perfect for that. You know, someone, another CEO is talking to a friend and they're like, oh, my daughter would be good for that. And again, we just skip over this interview portion and the job isn't actually open to the general public. And I mean, that sucks. I wish that wasn't happening, but I do think it's a really powerful tool for those in marginalized communities to start utilizing and to say, hey, I know a woman of color, a disabled woman, a trans woman, whatever, whatever, who would be great in this role. And also we need this company to make space for that type of person, like two birds, one stone, baby. And I think even when it's not like a blatant bias situation like you're talking about of nepotism and and that kind of stuff, there is definitely a pattern that happens in virtually all workplaces except those that are really conscious about overcoming this, which is the, oh, you remind me of a younger me. I'm going to mentor you and take you under my wing and help move you along the track. Well, that happens to perpetuate existing stereotypes and existing social strata and wage gaps. Because if you're tending to pick people like you and you're in a position to make that call, then you already have some advantage and you're passing that advantage along to others who are like you. I mean, that's a terrible way for us to make hiring and advancement decisions. But it's sort of like the way that we're wired as people until we say, hey, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to specifically look for people with different points of view. I loved when Jada said that having kind of a a token person in the room puts that person in a weird spot. And I wanted to ask her so many more questions about that. Like I on some level, like I've been in the position lots of times of being the only woman on a team or in a room or especially now in personal finance talking about early retirement. I'm very often like the token chick in the interview. And I don't love that. But I do love the line that I have used before from Liz Thames, who writes the blog Frugal Woods and who was on the show back in season one one, I think. She has the line, be the token, but bring a friend. (laughs) I think that's like a very concise way to put kind of what you just said of like, 
say yes to those opportunities, even if you know you're being brought in as the token, but then think about that of how can I use this to lift up my community and not just to help myself. And I I love that. Yeah, I loved Jada's points around how to be truly inclusive and to be truly a safe space for, for people of all backgrounds, you need to not tokenize them and not be like, oh, well, the one black employee can put together the Black History Month lunch or whatever, you know, or we can ask that one Asian American employee, like, how do I use chopsticks? Don't do that. Those are called microaggressions. We don't want that. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. I do think it's so, so important to take that into consideration. And if you are a member of a marginalized community to know like, oh, I'm going to have to deal with this because that's the world. But do I have to go in alone? Is there a friend I can bring? Is there a support group within this business that I can find? I think that's, that's always so important to remember. And honestly, that kind of falls in line with Paula's point about like, we don't know everything that's coming down our career pipeline. We can't say, oh, yes, I'm going to do this by then and this will happen to me by then, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at how your work impacts the world and what you want to be doing in the world and how you can make the world better, like you will find a path. And I think that's so, so true. And that is something that I do love about the internet age of like, you really can take a well-trodden path and expand it into a new way. Like your voice always does matter, literally and figuratively. (laughs) You can do something that other people have been doing for a millennia and still add your own contribution and it will be valued. I loved that so much, her talking about taking things just one step at a time instead of feeling like you have to have the whole vision in place, I think was really important and powerful and is something that I think when you're staring down the beginning of your career or if you're at a point where you want to pivot and do something else, it feels like you have to have the whole thing mapped out. And I think her sort of freeing us from that thought, I just, I really appreciated that so, so much. But I also love the idea of figuring out your passion and purpose really just from following your curiosity. Like, I just don't think that ever leads you in a bad direction. I think saying, okay, I've learned enough about the work to know that I need to know more about this area. And that is exciting to me. I just, I thought, yep, that totally mirrors my experience in life. All the things I've discovered that have fired me up the most are where I learned a bit about them and then thought, wow, I really want to learn more. And I think that is so much less pressure. If you know, I'm going to find my purpose along the way by just following my curiosity and I don't have to have the whole thing mapped out. I can just take it one step at a time. That just feels so reasonable and healthy. The idea of work and career, I could spend forever thinking about it, but if you are someone who was the first in your family to kind of enter a specific workforce, or you feel like you had to kind of ninja your way into something, or you're kind of striking out on doing your own thing, we would love to hear from you. You can always email us, fairsense at gmail.com, and we are on Twitter and Instagram, so you can tweet us or leave a comment or DM us, and that is at fairsense for both of those. Yeah, and we have another episode on this theme of evolving careers coming up in a couple of weeks. So we'd love to read some notes on air, or you can email us a voice memo if you want to have your actual voice up here. Tell us what your experience has been and and what lessons you've learned, especially what advice you might give to others who are navigating an ever-changing economy and career world and, and what has worked well for you. I do want to say we have gotten several like really supportive, really enthusiastic notes from I don't want to say older, but like middle-aged white men recently. And I am just here for y'all. So thank you all for listening. We got one from Daniel recently. The title, the subject of the email was hell yeah email, which I'm like, (laughs) Daniel, yes. And he said, hell yeah, thanks for your work. I just listened to episode 33, which is on women's voices, literal voices, and wanted to make sure you guys heard some positive feedback as I'm sure you got some negative feedback. Thank you, Daniel. We really appreciate you. And so I, I just want to say, you know, like this is not just for our ladies. This is for our men too. We see you out here. Thank you for being who you are. Yeah. And I'll add our most recent review on iTunes is written by Danny, who I'm going to assume is a guy, Danny Kruger. And so thank you. This is a great, well-considered podcast. And I can't stress how much I enjoy these two's attitude. Keep me coming. I assume he meant keep it coming, but like we'll go with it. <laughs> Either way. I love it. Yeah. 
when we've done surveys, we found that a decent number of guys are listening, like almost half, if you can believe it. So um, shout out to the guys who are listening. You're, you're the good ones. We appreciate you. And we'd love to hear from you too. Yeah. And if you want to leave us a review, good or bad, but preferably good, you can find us. <laughs> You can leave us a review on iTunes. Obviously, we read them. We love them. And a review, you can just hit those stars. We really appreciate that. And if you're inclined to leave a bad review, instead of that, how about stop listening to this podcast? Because life is too short to hate listen. <laughs> go find a different one. Find a hobby. Go outside. Take a walk. Go outside. <laughs> just get outside, guys. Uh, yeah. <sighs> We wish you light and love, everyone, even the people who need to go outside. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go find that light. All right. So we'll be back in a few weeks talking more about evolving careers. And until then, stay rad. Stay rad. The Ferris Sense are Kara Perez and me, Tanya Hester. Editing by me. Our theme song is by The Insider, and all other music is courtesy of the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You can always find me at OurNextLife.com and Kara at BravelyGo.co. Am I wrong about that? Maybe it, it's not. I don't know. Listen, this is, you know, sort of still America. You can have freedom of speech. All right, we'll cut that out, but, um, or not, whatever, it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs>